This presentation is part of a series of presentations on infection control in care homes. The key outcomes are to understand how infections are spread and to understand how to prevent the spread of infection by understanding the core elements of standard infection control precautions. Also, to understand the key principles of reducing the spread of viral gastroenteritis in care homes. The first four presentations focus on the core elements of standard infection control precautions. The first focuses on cleanliness and decontamination. The second focuses on bloodborne viruses and the management of inoculation injuries. The third focuses on the use of personal protective equipment. The fourth focuses on hand hygiene. Standard infection control precautions should be applied in all healthcare settings to reduce the risk of infection to patients, residents and staff. The fifth presentation focuses on the key principles for reducing the spread of viral gastroenteritis in care home settings. A study undertaken in long-term care facilities in Wales in 2010 found that 2.5% of residents had a healthcare associated infection. 49% of the infections were urinary tract infections, 25% were skin and soft tissue infections, and 20% of residents had a respiratory tract infection. Infections are caused by germs such as bacteria and viruses. It is important to remember that our bodies are covered in bacteria and the bowel is densely packed with bacteria. Usually they live with us without causing any problems. However, sometimes they multiply and start to cause problems in the body this is known as infection. Infection can occur from the person's own germs or from germs from another source. When infection is caused by germs from another person, this is known as cross-infection. In order to understand how to prevent the spread of germs which might lead to cross-infection, it is important firstly to understand how germs can spread. For spread to occur, there has to be a source of infection. This is often a person. The environment and any equipment that has not been cleaned properly can also be a source of infection. Staff who come to work when they have an infection can be a source of infection, and sometimes the source can be a visitor who visits while he or she has an infection such as norovirus. For the infection to spread to another person, there has to be a route of transmission. A common route of transmission are the hands of staff. Equipment that is shared between people and that has not been cleaned thoroughly can also be a means of passing germs on from one person to another. It is possible for food, water, drugs and blood to be a route of transmission. Some germs are passed on by the airborne route. An example of this would be the common cold or pulmonary tuberculosis. For the cycle of spread to continue, the germs must gain access to the body. This can be by a wound, a burn or a drip. It can also be by a device such as a urinary catheter or nasogastric feeding tube. All of these bypass the body's natural defence mechanisms and enable the germs to enter the body where they can go on to cause infection. There also has to be a susceptible host. This means someone who is prone to infection. There are a number of reasons why someone might be vulnerable to infection. They include being ill, being old, being injured, being burned, being malnourished or having a compromised immune system. If a susceptible host develops an infection, this person could then be the source of infection for other people and so the cycle of spread continues. There are interventions that can help reduce the risk of infection. For example, removing devices like urinary catheters when they are not essential. To prevent cross-infection, the cycle of spread can be broken at the root of transmission by the decontamination of hands, equipment and the environment, and also by the correct use of personal protective equipment. These actions reduce the risk of transfer of germs. Standard infection control precautions aim to break the cycle of spread of infection. 
In order to be effective, they must be applied by all healthcare workers to the care of all people in all healthcare settings, whether you think that the person has an infection or not. The EPIC 2 standard infection control precautions were published in the Journal of Hospital Infection in 2007. The first aspect of standard infection control precautions is cleanliness and decontamination. So why is the cleanliness of the environment and of equipment important? The healthcare environment and equipment may provide a source of germs that, when passed on, may lead to infection in other people. Also, people notice the environment and may equate poor standards of hygiene with poor standards of care. A clean and physically dry environment and equipment reduces the risk of the environment and equipment being the source of germs which may cause infection. Germs are less likely to survive and multiply on surfaces and in areas that are clean and dry. Therefore the environment and equipment must be visibly clean, free from dust and soilage including blood and body fluid. It is important that all healthcare workers are aware of their responsibilities relating to maintaining a clean and safe environment. The manager should, should decide who cleans what, when and how, and should ensure that the cleaning is satisfactory. Healthcare workers should be clear about their individual responsibilities. This slide shows an environment that is difficult to clean because it is cluttered. It is important that work areas are as clutter-free as possible to make cleaning easier. For cleaning to be effective, surfaces have to be intact and easy to clean. The surface shown in this slide cannot be cleaned effectively. Damage like this should be reported so that the area can be made good. This slide shows a door with damage to the paintwork. This cannot be cleaned properly. This slide shows a wall decorated polystyrene tiles and a paper border. Neither can be cleaned properly. This slide shows a floor with no vinyl. It is bare concrete. This cannot be cleaned properly. All these problems need to be reported and remedial action taken. This slide shows inappropriate storage of conti pads, which have been stored close to a slop hopper. They could easily get contaminated and then be used on someone. In summary, you should remove barriers to effective cleaning and make good any damage to the fabric of the building or equipment. You should declutter regularly and know how to report inadequate standards of cleanliness. You should know how to report defects that it might impact on cleaning. Any equipment that needs to be shared between residents should be decontaminated between use. Decontamination is a process which renders a piece of equipment safe for further use. It will always involve cleaning the equipment and may also involve disinfecting or sterilising the equipment. This will depend on what the equipment is going to be used for. The most important step in decontamination is cleaning. All blood and body fluid must be removed from equipment and this must happen before an item can be disinfected or sterilised. What should be decontaminated? You should decontaminate all equipment that is used with residents or come into contact with their environment. You should decontaminate anything which is visibly soiled and all equipment being sent for servicing or repair. These items should have a certificate of decontamination. This slide shows some of the equipment you may have in your workplace, such as tourniquets and stethoscopes. You should be clear on how to decontaminate them, and you should check the manufacturer's guidance on decontamination. Whatever pieces of equipment you have, you should be aware of what needs cleaning, how to clean it and what to clean it with. 
You should also know if an item needs to be disinfected or if it needs to be sterilised. The choice of decontamination method depends on the infection risk associated with in the intended use of the equipment. Cleaning is the physical removal of germs, blood and body fluid from surfaces and is usually performed with detergent and water. It is essential to inspect the items cleaned to ensure that they are free from all dirt, blood and body fluid. Disinfection is the process used to reduce the number of harmful germs to a safe level. Heat disinfection methods are more effective than chemical methods and should be chosen whenever possible. Disinfection does not usually kill spores. If an item needs to be disinfected, you need to ensure that an appropriate disinfectant is used. The disinfectant needs to be compatible with the item to be disinfected and it needs to be diluted properly. Too dilute and it may not work. Too concentrated and it may cause harm without being any better at disinfecting. The item needs to be in contact with a disinfectant for the correct amount of time. You should always wear the correct personal protective equipment as stipulated by the manufacturer in the data sheets and cost assessments. When you purchase new equipment, you should always think of how you're going to decontaminate it. Be, be sure to check before you buy. Sterilisation is a process used to render an object free from all forms of germs, including spores, and is performed in a HSDU. When you are decontaminating an item, you should use the correct personal protective equipment. This usually involves wearing gloves and apron. You should wear a visor if there is a risk of splash to your face. Wash your hands before you start and when you finish the procedure. You should use a product which is compatible with the item as advised by the manufacturer. You should dry all equipment before you store it. You should report any damaged surfaces and equipment that cannot be cleaned effectively and are therefore an infection risk. You should be aware of how to report problems that will impact on cleaning. You should condemn or repair faulty equipment and, when you buy new equipment, you should make sure it's easy to clean and that the disinfectants recommended are available locally, are safe and easy to use. You should inform your manager if there has been a failure in decontamination and you should al always remember that you have a duty of care to make sure that the environment and equipment is safe for the next person. Ask yourself, would I be happy to be nursed in that environment or for that equipment to be used on me? Would it be good enough for a member of, of your family? This slide shows two commodes. One can be cleaned effectively, the other is badly damaged and has lots of sleek tape on it and no amount of cleaning and disinfectants would make it safe for use. Which one would you want to sit on? This symbol is sometimes seen on packaging of items such as syringes and catheters. It indicates that the item is single use and cannot be reused even on the same person. Some equipment is single patient use. This means that it can be used several times but only on the same patient and only providing that you decontaminate it between uses according to the manufacturer's guidance. These items usually have a maximum number of times that they can be used before they have to be disposed of. You should check the manufacturer's guidance and you must never use these items on another person. Residents in care homes should always have their own combs, brushes, razors and toiletries. Bedding should be laundered in a way that allows thermal disinfection. Crockery and cutlery must be washed in a dishwasher. Further information is available in the Public Health Wales publication, Communicable Disease Control, a Guide for Care Staff. Remember that infection control is everyone's business and everyone has a role to play in protecting your residents.